The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Most people we know have strong opinions about radio commercials. If you're that way, we'd like your opinion about the middle commercial on this Equitable Society program. It deals with the Equitable Education Fund the painless way to pay for your boy or girl's college education. See if you don't agree that this commercial is sincere and straightforward and packed with helpful information. See if you don't agree that it performs a real service for parents who are concerned about their children's future. You'll hear this informing message from the Equitable Society in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Phantom Bandit. There are in the United States today more than 200,000 law enforcement officers, an army made up of local police, county sheriffs, state troopers, and members of federal enforcement agencies like the Federal Bureau of Investigation. They fight a never-ending 24-hour-a-day battle against the criminal population of the country. And while there is little hope that crime will ever be completely eradicated, there is great hope that it can be controlled, controlled more than it is today. That is not a utopian dream, for it can be brought about, can be attained in one single way, through the complete cooperation with law enforcement of you, the decent people of America of every one of you, for the common good. Tonight's file opens in a roadhouse located on a lonely stretch of highway on the outskirts of a large Midwestern city. Inside this building, a dozen or more couples move slowly about the dance floor as the band is just finishing a set of tunes. After the scattered applause, the dancers drift back toward their table. Well, we better think about going home. Home? Yes, it's almost 12. Well, so what? That sitter is costing us 50 cents an hour. Mary, honey, this is our anniversary. We're celebrating. I know, but... Now, look, you just sit down. You forget about the 50 cents an hour and, and listen to that piano, huh? Okay. You hear what he's playing? Uh-huh. Come on, let's just hold hands and listen, huh? Okay. Hey. What? That man over there. Who? That one, sitting sitting with the guy who runs the place. He looks just... Hey, Mary, it's him. Oh, what are you talking about? Did I ever tell you about that bank holdup? You mean when you worked in the bank at Spring City? Yeah, yeah, he's one of the holdup men. Are you sure? I'm positive. He's the man who handed me the note demanding money. Well, what can you do? I... I don't know. You mustn't come near him, Ralph. If he is, the man, he'll have a gun. I know, honey. I'm not that brave. Look, let's go home. You can call the police from there. Yeah, but he might leave before the police got here. What else can you do? I, I could call from here. Oh, no. He's friendly with the man who runs the place. Somebody might hear you. Wait, wait. I, I think I got it. You get in the car, drive down the road to the gas station, and, and use their phone, huh? I'll wait here and see that he doesn't get away. Hey, Bud, a lady named Jackson called for the police from here. That was me. Please, let's go to the Adams Roadhouse. What for? The man I called about is there. Who is he? A bank robber. Hop in. Thank you. This is Lieutenant York. Hello, Hello. Mr. Jackson. I didn't take your call. 
Well, what's this all about? My husband saw a bank robber at Adams Roadhouse. Uh-huh. You see, before we were married, he used to work in a bank, and, and it was robbed two and a half years ago. He was the teller at the counter that was held up. Uh, who used to work at a bank? My husband. Where? In, in Spring City, California. Go ahead. Well, we, we went to the Roadhouse tonight to celebrate our anniversary. My husband saw a man sitting at a corner table with Mr. Adams. That's the proprietor. My husband said it was one of the men who robbed the bank that day. Was he sure? Yes. Well, if I arrest this man, your husband will have to sign a complaint. He'll sign it, only please, let's hurry. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Jackson. Thank you. Where's your husband sitting? Over this way. Come on. That's the table, right? Oh. What's the matter? He was not there. You sure it was that table? Uh, yes. Well, there's a waitress. Let's check with her. Uh, miss? Yes, sir. Uh, there was a man sitting at that table. Do you know where he went? No, sir. Is this your station? Yes, sir. Uh, Mrs. Jackson, was she your waitress? Well, I... I don't remember. Would you like a table? No, thanks. Uh, that other man, the, the one your husband saw, where is he sitting? He's over at that. He's gone, too. Well, look around the room. Can you spot either of them? Let's see. No. How about the bar? The bar? Over there. Oh. No. Officer, something's happened to Ralph. I know it. Now, take it easy. But he said he'd wait here uh, hello for Hello there, Lieutenant. Oh, hello there, Adams. Mr. Adams, what have you done with my husband? Your husband? About 20 minutes ago, we were both sitting at that table over there, and we saw you talking with a man who was a bank robber. Lieutenant, uh, what's this all about? You were sitting and eating with him. I'm afraid you're mistaken. I went out to call the police while my husband stayed here. Now he's gone. They're both gone. What have you wait done with Wait a him? minute, wait a minute. Let's get this straightened out right now. I haven't sat with anyone all night long. But you were sitting And I the... don't know where your husband's gone. But you saw us here tonight. Lady, you dead. couldn't have been here tonight. I never saw you before in my life. You weren't shooting at me. What? Oh, hello, Earl. Hi, Jim. You finished? Yeah. I'd like to talk to you. Oh, sure, sure. Let's get off the line, though, huh? Yeah. Oh, what's on your mind, Earl? I ran into something that might be a case for both of us. Oh? A woman called in a complaint last night from a gas station out on Route 11. I answered it, picked her up, and drove her to Adams Roadhouse. Yeah? Well, what was the complaint? Uh, she said she and her husband were at the roadhouse celebrating their anniversary when her husband spotted a man who he recognized as a bank robber. Ah. Oh. He sent her out to call us, but when we got to the roadhouse, she couldn't find a trace of this robber or her husband. Hmm? Too much party? Well, that's what I thought at the time. But this morning, I decided to do a little checking. And? I learned that it really was their anniversary and that they had planned to go to the roadhouse. Her husband's a legitimate citizen, came to town two years ago when his father died and took over the family business. Did she say how he happened to recognize this bank robber? Yeah. Uh, her story is that her husband was a teller at the bank that was held up. Oh, where was this? Spring City, California. she know when the robbery took place? Uh, about two and a half years ago. Well, I can check on that part of the story for you. I wish you would, Jim. I don't know why. I, I just have a feeling that she might have been telling the truth. I'll put a special on it, Earl. The minute I hear anything, I'll drop by headquarters. Adams. I thought you were going to call. Oh, I was sleeping. Since last night? Yeah. What about that Jackson guy? He's here. Alive? I think so. I got him tied up in the other room. I ain't looked in there for a while, though. What do you figure on doing with him? And I've been sitting here trying to decide whether to knock him off or not. I'll call you back when I make up my mind. <laughs> Oh, 
Joel, I got some news for you. On the Jackson case? Yeah. We just got a teletype back from our Los Angeles office. Now, what's the dope? The Spring City National Bank was robbed two and a half years ago, and the sole ident came from a teller named Jackson. Then his wife was telling the truth. Yeah. Anything else in the teletype? One of the Bennetts was called Corby. Jackson overheard him addressed by that name during the robbery. It sounds like a nickname. Uh huh. I can't think of any local hoodlum who uses it. I'll, I'll check anyway. Okay. Oh, uh, Earl, have you been in touch with Mrs. Jackson this morning? Yeah. Still no word from her husband. You know, it seems pretty apparent now that he was taken out of that roadhouse. Yeah. Seems to me it'll be a little hard to do without Mr. Adams' consent. That's true. But how can we prove that he's involved in it? In fact, how can we prove any of it? Well, I don't know. Well, tell me, how much do you know about Adams? Well, nothing personally, Jim. But he runs a clean place, doesn't serve after hours, nobody gets rolled. I think we should check into his background, though. Good idea. Look, I'll, I'll go over to the state liquor board. Adams had to fill out a questionnaire before he could get a license to run that roadhouse, so I'm going to take a look at it. If I get anything, I'll pay Mr. Adams a visit. Mr. Adams? Uh, yes, yes, that's right. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Here are my credentials. Well, sit down, Mr. Taylor. Uh, have a drink? No, thanks. All I want is some information. Oh, all right. Uh, what can I do for you? I came to find out what happened to a customer of yours who disappeared last night. <laughs> oh, not that again. Yeah. What can you tell me about it? Well, the dame had too much whiskey. We believe there's something to her story. Now, look, Mr. We Taylor. checked up uh, on her husband. He was a bank teller two and a half years ago when a bank was robbed. Well, so what? Adams, do you uh, know anyone with the nickname of Corby? No. You're not telling the truth. Oh, now, wait a I minute. I checked your application for a liquor license, Adams. You put down Homer Falls as your birthday. That's right. Well, I wired the Homer Falls police. They tell me you've got a record. Look, mister, that was one local pinch when I was 19 years old. You don't have to defend yourself. The only reason I'm interested in your record up there is that you were arrested with someone named George Miller whose nickname was Corby. That was years ago. Nevertheless, you are linked with him. What are you driving at? Well, Mr. Jackson, the man who saw this bank robber here last night, testified at the time of the stick-up that one of the bandits was called Corby. So? So I think he's the man who was here with you last night. And when you found out that Jackson had recognized him, you and this Corby got rid of him. That's quite a story. Where did we take him? I don't know. Where is he now? Well, I don't know that either. You don't seem to have much proof. Oh, not yet. Look, you're wasting my time. Come back when you really get a case. Thanks, Mr. Adams. I will. <laughs> Oh, hello, Earl. You check on Adams? Yeah, yeah. Find anything? He had a record. And he'd been arrested years ago with someone nicknamed Corby. Did you go to the roadhouse? Yes, I confronted Adams with that. He just maintained that he'd never seen Jackson. Where'd you get his arrest record? From his hometown, Homer Falls. Any way of tracing this Corby through the Homer Falls police? No, he left there 20 years ago. Well, that's an odd enough name. He has to be the one to pull the bank job. And he had to be the one who was at that roadhouse last night, but we can't prove it, Earl. In the meantime, every hour that passes may put Jackson in greater jeopardy. They haven't already gotten rid of him, Jim. Well, I'd rather think there's a chance he's still alive. Jim, where do we start with this thing? We haven't got a single lead to work on. Earl, we're going to have to make our own. How? Through Adams. He's our wedge. Let's have him put under surveillance immediately. Okay. Then let's check his movements from the day that he left Homer Falls. It'll take time, I know, but we've got to start someplace. Come in. I'm looking for Lieutenant York. I'm Lieutenant York. My name is Ralph Jackson. What? Ralph Jackson. I understand you're looking for me. Why, man, you've been the subject of a statewide alarm. Jackson, what happened to you? Where, where did you go after you sent your wife out for the police? What do you mean? Well, didn't you tell her you saw a bank robber out at that roadhouse? I might have. I'll say anything when I'm drinking. Then that wasn't true? Of course not. But where did you disappear to? I got drunk and wandered out. Look, let me, let me call my wife, will you? I wanted to come here and take me home. <laughs> Well,
We will return in just a moment to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now a special message from the Equitable Life Assurance Society to fathers and mothers of young children, to parents of the generation of boys and girls who will graduate from college in the 1960s. Imagine how pleased you'll be in 10 or 15 years from today when that youngster of yours writes, Dear Mother and Dad, these years here at college have been wonderful. The things I've learned and the friends I've made will mean... More. After those four vital years, your boy or girl will face the future with far greater confidence for three very good reasons. First, college men and women earn more money. This morning, our employment counselor told me that college men actually earn $72,000 more during their working years than the fellows who miss out on this opportunity. Second... College men land the bigger job. He also said that out of every 16 men earning $10,000 a year or more, 15 are college grads. Third, college men get more out of life. They gain an all-round culture, an appreciation of the arts and literature, that means even more to them than their increased earning power. So, mother and dad, it's up to you. Up to you to give your children the chance they so richly deserve. Up to you to make their education sure with an equitable education fund. An equitable education fund? What's that? It's the painless way to pay for your children's college education. In this equitable society plan, you start when your children are young. Then, each year, you pay a sum of money that doesn't hurt, an amount that scarcely makes a dent in your budget. When your youngster's ready for college... The money's all ready for him. Well, that's spreading the cost of education over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a beating in four. Right. Now, suppose the father dies or becomes totally disabled. Then no more payments are necessary. The fund becomes fully established. When the youngster is ready for college, he gets the same education as if his dad had lived. So don't delay a day longer. Let your equitable society representative show you how little it costs to start an equitable education fund. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Phantom Bandit. In connection with tonight's program, we bring you a message from Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Mr. Hoover's message is, and I quote, 1950 has been a memorable year in the field of crime. For with almost one quarter of the year remaining, a continuation of the current rate of major crimes would mean a breaking of the nation's all-time record. Would mean that a year had passed in this country in which the number of major crimes would closely approach the two million mark. Crime is now becoming a vital factor in the lives of more and more innocent people. And it will continue to, unless the avalanche of lawlessness is stopped. It can be stopped. Of that, make no mistake, for pessimism is the ally of defeat. But the crime wave can be stopped in only one place, in the homes of America, by the parents of America. <laughs> Tonight's file continues at local police headquarters. Come in. Oh, hello, Mr. Jackson. Hello. Did you talk to your husband? Yes. What happened? He told me the same story he told you. Well, we don't think it's true, Mrs. Jackson. Do you? Well, I... look, he, he's waiting out in the car for me. I want to take him home. You haven't answered my question. He's my husband, Mr. Taylor. I've got to believe him. Will you excuse me? Yes, certainly. Oh, I, I do want to thank you for all the help you gave me. That's okay, Mr. Jackson. Goodbye. Bye, Mr. Jackson. Well, Jim, how long since you've been on a case like this one? I can't remember. I wonder why he's lying. Well, that's something we've got to find out, Earl. This case is still open as far as I'm concerned. You mean finding Corby? That's right. Did you get that teletype off to Washington? Yeah, and if I get a quick enough answer, we might still find out why Jackson told that story. Hmm. 
More salad, Ralph? No, thanks. Anything else? No. Ralph? Yes, dear? Do you want to talk about it? About what? Why you told the police that story. It was true, Mary. I don't believe you. Now, look. I know you were taken away by those men, and you're shielding them for some reason. Now, what is it? Ralph, you've got to tell me. Okay. Uh, A few minutes after you left the roadhouse last night, you called the police. This bank bandit started out the back door. I followed him. He crossed the parking lot and got into a car. I was afraid he was getting away, so I ran up to him, told him I knew who he was. I said he had to come back into the place and wait until you returned with the police. <laughs> Should have been suspicious when he agreed so willingly. You mean you went back into the roadhouse? Yeah. This man Adams came up. He asked what the trouble was, and I told him. And suddenly they both jumped me. I was hit on the head and knocked out. Oh, poor baby. When I came to, I was in a strange apartment. Arms and legs were tied. This, this bank robber was there with me. He said he's trying to make up his mind whether to kill me or not. Well, then how did you get away? He let me go. Well, Ralph, why didn't you tell this story to the police? Because he let me go on one condition. He said if I, uh, if I talked to the police, he said you and the baby would pay for it. So, you see, Mary, we just got to forget we ever saw him. Adam speaking. This is Corby. Oh, hello, Corb. Look, can I call you back? There's a couple of liquor salesmen waiting for me. Let them wait. It's only take a minute. That little business I want to talk over with you. All right, what is it? How would you like to buy me out? My half of the roadhouse. How much? What I put in it? Seven G's? Well, I don't know, Corb. Business hasn't been too good. Don't give me that. I know how business is. Now look, kid. You've established yourself as a legitimate guy around this place. If anybody finds out I'm your partner, it might not be too good for you. Is this a shake? Oh, I just need folding money. I'll take seven G's and I'll take it in cash. What do you say? Well, the bank's closed pretty soon. You've got time. Get me the money and bring it over here. It finally came up our turn. You got something on Adams? A hat full. The records at City Hall show Adams bought the roadhouse less than a week after that bank robbery out at Spring City. Uh-huh. He and a partner paid $14,000 for the place and all in cash. Forty? That's the amount that was stolen. Exactly. And you haven't heard it all yet. According to the bill of sale, Adams' partner was a man named Joe West. Joe West? I don't think I well, ever... Here, take a look at this. Huh? That's Corby's complete record from our files in Washington. George Miller, nicknamed Corby, also known as George Morton, Joe Morton, Joe West. Uh-huh. How does that sound? Real nice. But, Jim, if Corby has had a half interest in the roadhouse for these last two and a half years, where's he been? Look at the last notation on the record. Hmm? At the bottom there. Carson State Prison. Ah, seems he went out and did a job solo. Oh, is that the information from the bank? Yes, Mr. Taylor. Thanks very much. Now, let's see. Hey, Earl, our friend Adams withdrew $7,000 in cash just a half an hour ago. That's half what they paid for the roadhouse. Yeah. Well, could be he's buying out Corby's piece. That's where he must have been heading when he left the bank. You know where he is? Well, I did until half an hour ago, and he shook the man who had him under surveillance. But come on, Earl, we might still find out where they are. <laughs> Who is it? Me, Adams. Oh. Come on in. Okay. You get the bill? Uh huh. There you are. I got some papers for you to sign, too. Transfer of ownership. Oh, sure. Yeah, let's have them. Hey. 
Hey, where's the guy? Huh? The bum we clobbed the other night. What'd you do with him? Oh, uh, I let him go. You... You what? I didn't want to fool with a murder rap, so I let him go. So he can run right to the cops? No, he won't. I made a deal with him. I reminded him what could happen to his wife and kid. That and a dime will get you on a bus. Look, Corby, are you trying to put the heat on me? What do you mean? I pay you seven G's. I own the joint. Then that bank clerk can come along and blow a whistle. Not a chance. That's what you think. Well, I'm taking back my dough. Uh, it's no deal, Corby. You're not playing me for a sucker. Hello, fellas. Huh? The bank guy. What did you come back here for? To show us the way. Don't move, either one of you. I'll cover him, Jim. What is this? You told me to get a case, Adams. Well, I've got one. Now, put out your wrist. George Miller and Harry Adams were tried and convicted in federal court on a charge of bank robbery. And each was sentenced to serve a term of 20 years in a federal penitentiary. Special Agent Taylor and Lieutenant York arrived at the furnished room of George Miller, nicknamed Corby, because they were able to convince Ralph Jackson to break his silence and to reveal where he had been held captive. The capture of George Miller and Harry Adams two and a half long years after the commission of their crime is proof once again that nobody gets away with anything. True, a criminal might break the law and enjoy freedom for a while, but the machinery of law enforcement is merciless and relentless in its quest. Sooner or later... The net will close, and with it will close the career of the criminal, of our common enemy. Now, one last word to fathers and mothers. Of all the things you can do for your children, there's no greater proof of your love for them than an equitable education fund. They'll be grateful for it as long as they live. Your boy or girl may only say a few words like, Thanks, Mom, and thank you, Dad. But you know from the look in his eye and the ring in his voice that he'll never forget your foresight in starting an equitable education fund. Right now, make that wise resolution to see your equitable representative soon. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. File number 289. Its subject, Jailbreak. Its title, The Dark Journey. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of places or persons, living or dead, is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Betty Blythe, Lamont Johnson, Wally Mayer, Edmund McDonald, Ken Peters, John Sheehan, and Gene Tatum. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Dark Journey on This Is Your FBI. Stay tuned for the adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. There's fun for the whole family when Ozzie and Harriet come your way next.